I am ranked number one. One! That means I'm the best. I think you guys would have the same experience as me, but the internet allows me to see so much boxing that you have to wonder, when you consume so much, do you get desensitized to the realities of the sport? And then when incidents like the Ukraine kid the other day who died in the ring, then you wake up a bit and realize, man, this ain't a game. But are we desensitized to the realities of what should be obvious? There are people in boxing actually... um I'm going to say attacking Rob McCracken for his comments. And inadvertently what you're doing is making the same arguments that the BMA or anyone anti-boxing is making against boxing. Concussions in boxing are as regular as you taking a number one or two in the toilet, basically. As Ben Davidson said, if you're going to attack, Robert McCracken will attack me. But he didn't stop the fight when Wilder knocked down Fury in the 12th. Heavy knockdown. Didn't I hear there was arguments in the corner because some people in Tyson's corner wanted the fight stopped after the second knockdown. So that was pretty serious and they let it carry on. What about Kovalev? He won a fight recently. What, that seventh round was therapeutic for the brain, was it? But he still won the fight. He was knocked down several times by Alvarez. Heavy knockdowns. And was knocked out. Rob's got to watch what he says. He has to remember he has arguably the most popular face of boxing as his number one charge and these stories are going to be picked up i wonder why um this charity who's going at rob mccracken headway why aren't they talking about certain boxers who retired this week and have quite noticeable slurred speech right now well we know why because said fighter was only a southern area champion can't get much traction talking about that the fighter i'm talking about is wadi camacho and he has four or five losses by stoppage. They're quite comprehensive stoppages, some of them. And I've seen a few of them. How many times has Wadi's trainer seen Wadi concussed or in really bad shape and still continue to train him, still continue to let him fight in fights where he's been hurt badly? I mean, does this make the trainer some evil guy? No, this is boxing. This is how boxers and coaches make their living. This was the first time AJ's got stopped. This guy's got stopped several times. And the fact that boxing people are taking this opportunity to jump on Rob, it kind of looks like they want to shut down the sport. Maybe they're just that desperate to get anyone connected with Eddie Hearn. Crazy. Marquez versus Pacquiao. Three knockdowns in the first round. Anyone put any questions to Nacho Berestein? If you guys believe that Robert McCracken is the first coach who's had to see his fighter go for a concussion and make a judgment call whether he's going to let him try to um, shake it off and weather the storm, then the sport's finished. You're making the same argument as the anti-boxing brigade now. And because you've got an agenda, rather than you say, well, maybe I'd better not use this to throw darts at Eddie Hearn and AJ. No, you just steamed in like a crazy person because you don't like someone. I mean, that that's just crazy. Well, you think you're doing AJ or Eddie Hearn damage. You know, you're doing the sport more damage than anything like that. There must be somewhere where you don't try and score points on this one. Any of your fighters might have to suffer a knockdown and fight through it. And there's boxing fans who understand that fighters get buzzed, get concussed and fight through it. We shouldn't be pointing the finger at the trainer to score points. What about Tim Bradley versus Provodnikov? Tim had to learn to speak again after that fight. But he won. I had Provodnikov up on the scorecard. But Tim won the fight. No one questioned Joel Diaz. So because Robert McCracken verbalized something that most trainers just haven't said but have done the same thing, they're just going to jump on this story? Well, tell us something new. Because if we was to take the medical definition of a concussion, the woman said every knockdown basically is a concussion. That's what the woman said. I don't know how she um, came to that conclusion or what the study was. But if that becomes the barometer to say that this is when the fight should be stopped it's goodbye boxing it's goodbye boxing boxing is on thin ice trying to justify its existence it's on icy ground with the first principles of what it stands on where the intention is to strike damaging blows aimed at your opponent you can win on points but the knockout is what is desired all McCracken did was say what happened in the fight and what happens every day or weekly 
in the ring. Quite an innocuous comment because he's not a foul mouth shouter or a screamer. Andre Ward has two heavy knockdowns against him on his resume. The Darnell Boone one and the Kovalev one. And Virgil Hunter let him fight through both of them. What about Carl Froch and Groves? And the knockdown he suffered against Jermaine Taylor Froch. Or when Groves fought the Scottish guy years back. The hard hitting Scottish super middleweight was Anderson. Should have stopped that? Perhaps. Because Groves was in serious shit. In serious shit. But he weathered it and got through it. No one considers that. Well, they've reduced the fights down to 12 rounds, even though that was for advertisement purposes more than any empirical study. That 15 rounds is more dangerous than 12. But nevertheless, there's less rounds at championship level. They don't fight as frequently. Nowhere near. The medicals are way more stringent. We now have MRI scans. After you're knocked out, a 28-day suspension in the UK is automatic. And you don't necessarily get cleared after that. You can get up to three months or an indefinite suspension after a knockout at the discretion of the British Boxing Board of Control. And that's as safe as you can make it after that. It's judgment calls from coaches and doctors. Can't just throw them under the bus because we don't like them or because, you know, it's a high profile case. I could pick out loads of stories then where we'd have to charge coaches for negligence. If more people like this headway head injury charity, anti-boxing people challenge boxing if it comes a more common occurrence we're gonna need some serious debaters to win that debate and i mean serious debaters like rob mccracken saying the fight to safety is paramount as far as he's concerned is all well and good and um it reeks of good intention but unless you're using a martial art as a last resort when confronted by violence you can't really justify a statement like that as well intended as you can try and make it. You can't. McCracken used to box. He knows what it's like for AJ. Same with Buddy McGirt. He used to box. Former world champion. But I see the way it's affected Buddy. I reckon Buddy has been more affected by boxing, coaching, than when he was actually boxing. Actually a two-weight champion. Look how he responded after Kovalev's seventh round. One more round like this and I'm going to stop the fight. That was Kovalev's first bad round of the fight. And it was a pretty bad round. But there was obviously carryover from the Ukraine kid he was coaching. who was stopped, taken out of the arena in a stretcher and died days later. There was obviously carryover from that. So coaches care. Coaches care. But they can't justify sending boxers out there and saying their safety is paramount. You're putting them in the battlefield. That'd be like Tony Blair saying, yeah, I'm sending the troops out there for whatever political reasoning or ideology. Saying that their safety is paramount. No. Safety being paramount is not sending him out there. Literally. Kovalev won by a lengthy margin in the end. Let's have a look how reactionary most people are. Because that's not the first time Robert McCracken has let AJ continue after taking a heavy shot. What about the knockdown against Klitschko in the fifth, was it? Took AJ a few rounds to recover. A few rounds. The fight looked lost. The difference is AJ won that fight. So now McCracken looks like a hero. The internet is not good for boxing. For other sports, it's okay. But it's not good for boxing. Because the amount of interviews, like pointless interviews actually, that the trainers and boxers are subjected to, a lot of shit comes out that doesn't need to come out. Because this brain injury charity, Headway, has called it a shocking admission from Robert McCracken. And he's had to come out and say that the health of his fighter is of paramount importance. He said, I'm not a doctor, and it may be that concussed is not the right term to have used, McCracken said on Thursday. Well, it is. Well, it is. But this is why the camera is not that great a place for boxing, because when people just speak the realness, the reality of the situation, then, yeah, headway are going to jump on it. And, yeah, those who are not adjusted to boxing like we are, they'll be thinking, what the hell? He was concussed and you let him fight? Britain's been fighting the anti-boxing brigade longer than any other country in world boxing. This was the country where they started to do some tests and make clinical definitions on how dangerous boxing was in the 60s. 
Well, the most important organ in the body is the brain. The most important medical question then in boxing is whether it damages the brain. And there's no doubt it does so. Now, that might not sound like anything groundbreaking, but at the time, it's massive. Or news coming out like that was massive. It, I've got it recorded. Just haven't bothered to dig it all up where you can hear boxers like Billy Walker saying, no, we don't believe that boxing causes brain damage. And this is how boxers around the world used to think. Like boxers walking around with these traumatic headaches for years and thinking, ah, it's not boxing related. Well, what else is it? Because there was no clinical definition. It was a different time. The public accepted their fate way more back then. That's just how life was. They didn't question things, at least not as much as people do today. Like little kids in the household back then, you've seen and not be heard. That, that was um, expected of kids. But kids, they question things these days, don't they? They question adults, they question authority. They used to smoke in hospital wards over here. Because at one stage, some people would argue that cigarettes were good for you. Yeah, believe it or not. Because just like there was a stage boxing didn't have no clinical synopsis, to suggest it was dangerous. Punches to the head correlates to head trauma. Same thing with smoking. People smoked for years and there was no cancer diagnosis made from the medical profession. So they just smoked and thought it was great. The other day, these people were having a go at Joshua for selling this Lucozade sports drink. They're having a game. How, how can you sell these sugary, dangerous products full of sugar? Dude, they used to have Lucozade on the wards in the hospital <laughs> like it was a medicine. You know what else they used to have in hospitals over here? They used to have Guinness because they believed it was high in iron and it was good for you. I don't know if um, America is more libertarian, but I think um, there's certain things in America they wouldn't bat eyelid at. But in England, they're going to make a big deal about it. Like what Rob McCracken said in America, I, I don't think... Um, it would have made a news story. Now, they probably have brain injury charities like Headway, but they're probably not as sensitive as the British ones. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I think America has become as PC as any other country out there. So maybe I'm wrong on that in 2019. But look at the stuff Wilder said about catching a body. If he had said that in Britain, they would have made more of a deal about that in the mainstream press. But Sweden got rid of boxing because they thought it was barbaric. So it can happen. The BBC got rid of boxing. They say it's because of Orly Harrison, but it just wasn't fitting in with the programming they were planning back in the early part of the millennium. That's the truth. And they've been pretty consistent on that ban. We haven't seen a professional boxing card on the BBC for maybe 15 years, 14 years, or maybe around that time, longer or whatever. Yeah. I've seen a few amateur world championship tournaments on there. And obviously when the Olympics are on, we get it, but that's it. But this is how delicate the ground that boxing stands on in terms of trying to defend itself. Rob was quite eloquent when he spoke. He didn't swear he wasn't aggressive or anything like that. He clinically described what happened, which happens all the time in boxing, because boxing has to give margins for error, whether a fighter's a little buzzed or concussed. It's a judgment call. I mean, it's the same with fouls in boxing. You're not allowed to punch below the waist throw rabbit punches, which causes a lot of damage. But the referee can't just throw you out because you throw a couple of rabbit punches or any other infringements. They have to give an allowance for foul tactics. And if a footballer or a rugby player, where there are quite a few concussions in both sports, you can get concussed from heading the ball, apparently. Although I never got concussed heading the ball. But I played a whole lot of football. And I don't know no one who I played with who had a concussion. If Rob McCracken was a football coach or a rugby coach saying, yeah, one of my star players, I knew he was a little concussed when he came out of the scrum in the first half. I asked him if he was okay to carry on. He said, yeah, I let him carry on. Headway may have been onto it, but they wouldn't call it a shocking admission because the difference is the intent in boxing is to strike the target area of the head. That, that is an intended goal. The head is the main prize. No, the body should never be neglected. Any less than the head. But the head is always the main prize. Al Heyman's a smart guy. Very smart guy. Very intelligent. I've never said any different. And if my memory serves me correct, he didn't allow a lot of dialogue between the fighters in the early PBC press conference and the Wayans. It was very um, 
straight to the point, get out of there, then fight time, they fight. And as you know, he doesn't do any interviews. There's no interviews or in talking about boxing anyway, anyway. And I think he realizes the reputation that boxing has. I think he realizes that. And he has an understanding of that. Now, it's changed a little at the PBC. They trash talk a lot more. So uh, he wasn't able to maintain wherever he was trying there. But I believe he was um, looking at TV audiences, making it more accessible to a very range of people. But if people are cursing, saying they're going to kill people and a whole lot of madness, then it, it's hard to do that. Same with endorsements. It's hard to get the same level of endorsements, which can um, sell products to a varied range of demographics young old mothers fathers kids and i was looking at that although when the likes of mike tyson was threatening to drive noses into the brain nose bones into the brain and eat people's children and james tony wasn't shy of a word or two you know it was a little different for boxing then the american boxer today doesn't have the same type of star power barring Mayweather. You know, when Hopkins won that unification tournament near the time of 9-11, Hopkins was a star in America. <laughs> right then, that was the peak of Hopkins' popularity in America. In the 80s and 90s, the only athlete, now, nah, I mean, someone's going to correct me from America, who was probably bigger than Mike Tyson, possibly, was Michael Jordan. But these days... LeBron James and the rest of them, they're way more popular than the boxers. Way more. It's not even a contest. And worldwide, Mike Jordan couldn't touch Tyson. Not worldwide. Not in England. Not in Britain anyway. Not in Europe. And don't get me wrong. The Jordan brand was massive in the United Kingdom. Huge. A phenomenon. But so was Mike Tyson. Smack talk in Britain. It wasn't always flowers and roses, I'm guessing, in the 50s and 60s, but... I think um, rivalries like Ben Eubank, Fro Watson in there from the 80s going into the 90s. Guys like Nassim Hamed. Smack Talk became a little more popular in British boxing. What I'm taking out of the whole thing is how fragile any defense of boxing is. You know, McCracken doesn't even like the camera. He's probably regretting ever going on the camera. That might be the last McCracken interview. And if they can contextualize his point to fit their narrative and agenda, when, what did he really say? So even me saying that he's got to watch what he says is just really stalling the debate because you can't say you have fighters safety paramount. You can try and say you're making them as safe as possible, but anyone coaching someone to fight for money or even just trophies as an amateur, you can't really say you've got their safety at Paramount. You can't. The safest thing, the safest you could keep anybody is to keep them out of a ring or out of violence on the street. You have to keep them out of it for their safety to be Paramount. Or as I said before, is to say it's self-defense. Last resort if you're attacked. Not going into a combat situation in a ring or an octagon. But if you're attacked, last resort is self-defense. There's a lot of other sports that statistically have a whole load of fatalities, brain injuries, other injuries, whatever. But they're not going to go after them sports because it would be ridiculous to do so. The intention in this sport there is to put the ball in the net. The intention of rugby is to get the ball over the line. But it's very dangerous at the same time. It is very dangerous. But the intention of boxing is to spark the opponent out. Hit him more times than he hits you. I was watching, I don't know if it was Formula One, and I saw one car fly off the track. And this happens often. More often enough that you can say, well, okay, the intention isn't to do that, but it happens so much. It has to be a concern how safe this sport is. But there's the margins. The margins are so thin. The intention isn't to drive your car off into the stands. In boxing, the intention is to concuss your opponent that's how he doesn't get to hurt you now you can make counter arguments it's a science there's boxers who look to outpoint their opponents yeah but if the knockout opportunity arrives they'll take that too how can you have a debate about boxing 
and not talk about the concussed state that some opponents find themselves in. How can you? Can you really have that debate? I mean, you have to be watching what you're saying every second. When McCracken tried to clean up his earlier comments, he was saying, oh, perhaps concussion was the wrong word. He was a little lightheaded. Huh? Semantics. Lightheaded? Concussed? No, I'm not saying they're both exactly the same. If you were to go into the medical definitions, there'd be variations of definitions. But it's in the same ballpark, isn't it? You get hit and you're a little lightheaded. Or you're a little concussed. To the layperson, it's the same thing, literally. In Britain, the aristocracy used to do fox hunting. Now, it's kind of banned. They banned it, but these are rich, well-to-do people. They, I mean, are still doing what they're doing. Some of them go abroad and do it. There's ways around it. But why did it get banned? Why did it get banned? Because it was indefensible. They can say in defense of fox hunting, and here's some arguments I've took off the net. Foxes are a pest. They kill chickens. They are the top of the food chain. They are not eaten by anything else. So they will keep being a pest or they will get killed by farmers anyway. They rummage through rubbish bins, emptying it out onto the street. Fox hunting is a British tradition. Well, look, I mean, shit about rubbish bins is crazy. What, they're fox hunting to stop litter? It's ridiculous. Most littering is in built up areas in cities. Not in the countryside, wherever they're fox hunting. They say ending fox hunting will result in a loss of jobs. They banned it in 2005, by the way. But then you have the animal rights, the PC brigade saying killing foxes is inhumane and outdated. And arguments for banning it to counteract the arguments for keeping it. They're saying, yeah, nothing eats foxes, fair enough. But nothing eats lions or tigers, let's go kill them. It's not a bad counter. But it's not a great counter because we don't have lions and tigers in Britain. That argument you could use in a seven getty or wherever tigers reside. That argument could perhaps work there. They say fox hunting is a British tradition. And then they argue that there are traditions in this country that we don't adhere to anymore. So why should we stick to this one? So there's arguments for and against. But the bottom line is there's animal rights. And people think that it's inhumane to kill the foxes. Chase them down till they're exhausted and then outnumbered by the hounds in their packs. And it's over. And if you're talking about animal rights in this country, they love animals, bruh. Don't play with animals. Do not play with animals in this country. And let them animal rights people catch you. When it comes to brain injuries in boxing, it's very much a hindsight thing. I mean, one that kind of creeps me out is the Lavanda Johnson fight against Jesus Chavez because I remember watching it on Sky and not thinking nothing of it when he got stopped when he died later Lavanda Johnson I watched the fight again and I'm watching his right leg dragging as he's trying to move he's not walking literally dragging his leg to move Now, I saw his leg wasn't moving right, but I didn't equate it to brain damage. Maybe his leg's injured. I didn't equate it to a brain injury. And obviously, boxers hide a lot of stuff from their cornermen. No, I'm not hurt. I'm not hurt. Nothing's hurt him. Although Rob did say, yeah, AJ was concussed. So he saw it. He saw it. But he just didn't think it was as bad as that. Coaching is a pressure situation. Coach is going to shock too. Maybe he wasn't expecting this aesthetically unimpressive looking Mexican to be handling AJ like that. And he went into a bit of shock and a bit of denial maybe. It's all well and good you see in signs in the ring, but what about in the gym, in sparring, in training and stuff like that? Because I saw Joe McClellan blinking in the Julian Jackson fight. In the first Julian Jackson fight, I saw him blinking like how he was blinking against Ben. Now maybe coaches or gym members and entourage saw it, but they thought, ah, it's nothing. It's just Gerald. Is that residual carryover into the Ben fight? Some people put it down to his relationship with Manny Stewart. Stewart was in McClellan's corner in the first Julian Jackson fight. In the second one, he wasn't there. He was replaced by Stan Johnson, whose credentials were a little sketchy, at least compared to Manny Stewart's. He wore the, was it an admiral hat or whatever it was? And he didn't have 
the respect of McClellan. McClellan apparently used to deliberately hit him when he was doing the pads or holding the bag. And um, Manny Stewart had a lot to say about it. Apparently, they split because he owed Manny Stewart money. He said, when he left the crunk, that was it really. I knew he'd lose sooner or later. I heard that he wasn't doing his work. He was sparring every day, but that was as far as it went. This is why I heard that he didn't do anything else apart from try to knock guys out in the gym. He wasn't working on strategy. He wasn't doing his work. Now, Gerald had good stamina, good, good stamina when he was with me, just as all my fighters do, because the heated, low oxygen surroundings in the basement of the crunk forces you to have good stamina. Manny said he had Gerald on the rain machine after sparring. He prepared special meals for him before bouts. When Gerald left Manny, he said his training suffered and his eating suffered and his strategy suffered. And of course, his stamina suffered big time. After the Jackson rematch, McClellan moved up to super middle because he was chasing a Roy Jones fight. A fight that Jones didn't want. I'm interjecting there. A lot of people talk about McClellan's resume that the Jackson wins are the standout wins. There's not much more in there. There wasn't many people who wanted to fight Gerald McClellan. <laughs> I wonder if people realise that. He moved to super middleweight. Didn't get the Roy Jones fight. He went right at Nigel Benn. And he said, that's suicide. Why did he not pace himself? That was suicide against Ben. He was eating junk like burgers all throughout the training camp for the Ben fight. He had a hard time putting on weight. But Manny would prepare special meals for him and have him eating good food. He was even wrapping his own hands in the dressing room before the Ben fight. He wouldn't have made it without me, he said. I couldn't believe he was wrapping his own hands. I would drag the bandage tightly and precisely across the base of the wrist, securing the middle part of the thumb to bring balance to the hand, bulking up over the knuckles to level off the hitting area at the top of the fist, which relieves pressure on the two more prominent knuckles, then bringing the bandage around and under to form a comfortable ball in the palm of the hand. Gerald's fist was such a shape that when I did this, he could punch for a wall. Make no mistake about it, Gerald would have beaten Roy again. I don't think so, I know so. He had the speed, he was tall, physical, he had the chin. Uh, Roy knows full well what an awesome puncher he was. Not just in power, but in timing. He had so much going for him. If he had stayed with me, he would have put Roy out within six minutes of boxing. Gerald could have been the best of the 1990s. And I think he would have been had he stayed at the crunk. And, um... That's all in hindsight after the Ben fight. But a lot of people will testify and say, well, he was basically running the camp himself when he left Manny. You know. What about Watson versus Eubank? Yeah, the ambulance is messed up. The medical provision messed up. Ringside. No oxygen. According to Jimmy Tibbs, apparently they couldn't get a doctor in the ring for seven minutes. What happened there? Ill-equipped to deal with such situations. Yeah, they messed up. But I can go for a few scenarios and I have done I go back to the Mike McCallum fight for the WBA belt a year or so before that McCallum beat Watson up pretty bad it was a pretty bad beating it was a sustained beating been way better off just getting knocked out in the third or fourth way better off knocked out cold than that beating there head body all night head body beating there's some beatings you just can't recover from but he seemed to recover. He had a few wins. He beat Errol Christie, I believe. And was it Craig Trotter? And his last two fights were with Eubank. One at middleweight and the second at super middleweight. Arguably, he won the first fight. So I'm saying it could be carryover from the McCallum fight. But he had four good performances. Including the first Eubank fight. Before the event of the rematch. Now, when I go into the rematch. Mike beat up Eubank for the whole fight. For the whole fight. Eubank wasn't in the fight. You know what I mean? Just was beating him up. This wasn't like the first fight where it was a chess match. Mike changed his style. Mike was a counter puncher and he just started beating up on Eubank. All fight. But when you get to the 11th round, which um, sounds a bit indulgent to mention this considering what happened, but it's one of the best rounds in a British ring I've ever seen. Definitely one of the best. Like Eubank knew his unbeaten record was all but lost. He was outboxed outpunched all throughout the fight. He made a rally in the 11th, throwing a whole load of shots, trying to get Mike out of there. 
And there was two incidents in that round. And I'm not talking about when Mike floored Eubank. I'm talking about when Eubank was throwing a lot of shots at Mike. This was Eubank's best spell of the fight so far. And he's throwing a lot of shots. And there was one stage where Mike seemed to be leaning over the ropes. And it happened again. He was obviously fatiguing. But he was awkwardly leaning over the ropes a couple of times. Eubank trying to finish him. Empty the tank. Looked like there's nothing left. Michael carried on as usual. Landing his little short shots. Beating up Eubank. Down goes Eubank. Fight's over. Fight must be over. Michael realizing that this is his time now. I'm going to be champion. He walks in. And that right uppercut. AJ talking about a punch from the gods. Well, I don't know where that one came from, bro. I don't know where it came from. Don't ask me where it came from. Possibly one of the hardest super middleweight punches ever thrown. Michael's neck snapped back on the second strand. He got back up. The round was over. Michael was unable to walk back to his corner. Jimmy Tibbs jumped in the ring, grabbed Michael by his right arm, and Michael stumbled into the stool. I don't remember being able to hear the instructions. I remember Michael standing up for the 12th round. I don't know if the cornerman propped him up to stand up. Mike was so incapacitated he couldn't walk to the ring center to commence battle. The referee grabbed his left arm and Michael kind of, Michael kind of stumbled forward. His legs were rubbery as anything. Eubank flurried. The referee jumped in. So where do we start with his inquest? McCallum fight? Or the three fights or four fights in between? Sparring? When he leaned back on the ropes, the ropes were probably a little slack as well. Was there something in that? After Eubank landed the uppercut and he was assisted back to the corner, his brain obviously couldn't signal his legs to walk. When Jimmy Tibbs grabbed his arm, he instinctively stumbled, if you like, and walked to the corner. But his brain couldn't signal him to independently do that. Neither when he got back up to start the 12th round, he couldn't do that. The referee grabbed his other arm and once again he stumbled to the ring centre. Was there missed opportunities there? And then we don't need to go through the paramedics and all that. That's been done already. In hindsight, you can go so many places with it. Stadium fight. 22,000 people at White Hart Lane. And they're going crazy. Screaming. At the top of their lungs. Split seconds for fighters, trainers, cornermen. Referees to make judgments, ringside doctors, they're caught up in the drama as well. It's like no one shared that experience. I, I don't believe in the world like the British fans, the Watson Eubank Ben trilogy. It was sheer pantomime all the way through. It was, um, it was gripping. It was arguably the best time in British boxing ever for me as a boxing fan. Just a great period. Big up Michael Watson. I've met Mike after the second Eubank fight, I've spoke to him. But we're on a sick journey <laughs> as boxing fans. You know, when I self-analyze myself, we are. We're on a sick journey. And I'm not laughing like, ah, ha, ha, that's funny. I'm laughing because it is a sickness. It's not like when fighters get maimed and killed and crippled. We run away from the sport, the spectators. No, we're back for more and more and more. In a perverse way, when them tragedies happen it just reaffirms how real it is and how authentic it is and draws us in even more crazy to say but i said it 